Courage, the podcast where I, Amanda Pereira, sit down with a fellow female artist that I admire and ask them the questions I've never had the guts to ask them before. Sound scary? Well, it is. So I use a little liquid courage in the form of their favorite drink. We cheers, chat, and connect as I attempt to soak up all the wisdom these women have to offer. Today I sit down with Anne Pornell and enjoy some yummy, yummy grapefruit palm base. If you've seen a show at Second City Toronto in the past, like, five years, you've most likely seen her because she's written and performed in three main stage shows and is a cast member of She the People and She the People The Resistance Continues, Second City's first show ever that features all female identifying performers. You may have also seen her work on screen. She's written and performed on shows like This Hour Has 22 Minutes, Baroness Von Sketch Show, and The Beaverton. She just landed a role on the second season of Ghost BFF, written and created by the incredible Vanessa Matsui. You can see Anne improvising in The Oval, which streams live every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. on Bad Dog TV. You cannot talk about the comedy scene in Toronto without talking about Anne Pornell. She's an actor, improviser, writer, and a woman I admire immensely. Okay, I'm going to hit record on here. And now I'm just going to do a good old little... Nailed it. I've worked in TV, right? That's <laughs> happened. That's happened before. I don't even Hi, know why they Anne. do that. Hi. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually, I do. And you do. Do you I not don't. know why they do? Oh, really? No, I don't. I don't know why they, they clap uh, or, like, do the, the the sticks. I don't know. And are you putting me in a position where I get to teach you something? Because I legit I am, to learn. like, bless you if you're lying. Bless you. Oh, no, okay. So... It's so that they can take the video that they're recording and the audio that they're recording. And when it goes in a spike, they can sync it up. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I really could have come to it intuitively had I thought about it for more than three seconds. Yes. I think, it, yeah, like your heart knew what it was. Kind yeah. of, but my brain was just like, I, not above I your pay grade. That's above your yeah. pay grade. <laughs> well, we've also been in quarantine for how long? Have you have you filmed anything during COVID? I have Yeah, not. actually. Well, uh, How's it that was, been? It was from my home and it was like literally the second week of quarantine where I was like, <laughs> yeah, I can continue to do my job. And it <laughs> was like, I would say an hour and a half of setting up because I had to be in charge with like my phone and with the camera and all of it and 40 minutes of shooting. And it was for a, um, uh, uh, like a sizzle. Um, mm, and it yeah. was just. So like, oh, this is easy, but I don't want to do it for my husband. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even with self-tapes now and stuff, it's like there's oh. so much in it that you're like, for this self-tape, I'm going to put a little credits at the end and it's going to be like actor, uh, DP, uh, sound, editor. Like Lighting. it's a lot. It's Lighting. too much. And like yeah. I get so annoyed when like I see the breakdowns that us actors get and I see like non-negotiable scale and I'm like, I'm sorry, your company is literally making so much money because you're one of the companies that people are actually mm -hmm. buying from. Mm -hmm. And you're going to try to like lowball actors who have no work right now. Disgusting. And so then yeah. I don't even do them. <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay, then I'm not investing this time. Absolutely it's not happening. Not. No, no it's not they happening. don't care. And I'm like, the, I don't need it. I will give it to someone else who does need it a lot more than I do. I'm yeah. not, I'm not about that. Oh, that's yeah. a nice way of even thinking about it. Give it to someone who needs it. Yeah. The, yeah. Oh, oh I, and I just eyed um, the Palm Bays we're drinking today. I have to tell you. Oh, also cheers. Cheers. I've never done this little. Oh, look at your. See, you, you have been cast in a commercial and I haven't because <laughs> you're like so great good. with the product placement. Look at you. Ah. <laughs> I just need to get sponsored by Palm Bay, is it? Yeah. This is the you only deserve alcohol it. I drink. Thank you. Is it really? Is it the oh I interrupted you and that would have been a great little place to be like, this is the only yeah. So it's the only alcohol you drink, is this one? I mean kind of. Like honestly, I'm not much of a drinker because I do live a little bit further out, so I'm always driving everywhere. So mm -hmm. like for me to take the subway is never worth it anymore. I am <laughs> well in my thirties okay. and the Uber is just like I I have this thing where I'm like why didn't I just drive myself? It's never, mm. it's very rarely worth the $30 Uber home yeah. than it is just like not drinking and like, you know, just hanging out with buddies or doing a show. So yeah, this is just like drinking pop to me. You yeah. will, you will learn if you haven't been indoctrinated into the Palm Bay cult that it's just 
sugar water. It's just, it's sugar, just sugar water. water. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have to tell you, so I, I went and bought some, uh, I bought like the six pack that has like, you know, the thing around it that kills turtles, yes. which I will be cutting up huge. I will cut them into tiny little pieces. Um, but so I got home and I've been wiping down all my groceries with like those cleaning wipes. Uh And so I was trying to get in between them so that like the clean part wouldn't get on the dirty part that I hadn't wiped yet and whatever. And I don't know, I couldn't coordinate it. Not, I turned coordinate and quarantine into one word, which whatever it's topical. So that's fine. And I get one fell and it fell on the ground and the top got like punctured somehow. And I'm not even kidding you. It started, it was like a movie. It started spinning and yes. spraying. And my apartment is basically one big room. Oh no! So I just see it spraying. It's on my coffee table. It's underneath my table, like on the, it was everywhere. At least and all clear. I said, it is, at least it's clear. It's very yeah. sticky yeah. and I'm probably still have, and it smells nice. Yes. Yeah. Like, think this is basically a commercial for Palm Bay's. Honestly, pa- like, who's, who even makes Palm Bay? I don't know. Oh, I hope it's, oh, I'm scared. Is it Nestle? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, no, it, no. No. Delta? Oh, they're made in BC? <gasps> this is CanCon? Canadian? <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> what? Okay, well, who makes these? Somebody tell us. Tell us in the comments below. <laughs> that was very good. Tell us. Um, I also haven't worn lipstick in probably six months, but I had to put on lipstick for you today because what? I'm like, Anne is the queen of lipstick. No, please. You've already got the title. You don't have to wear it anytime. You're still the queen of lipstick. <laughs> but like, how the hell? I, but then I was like, I, I'm going to be drinking. How do you wear lipstick and also drink and like perform? And I get sweaty and keep it looking good. I literally just put it on before the show and then it wears off and then I don't care about it. I will only apply lipstick once. I am not a person who reapplies because I find that my lips get, I don't, I don't know what it is, but anytime I put on a second, uh, a reap, mm-hmm. it's so like crusty. It doesn't, mm, it's not a chalky. nice, yeah. yeah. And so I'm just like, maybe like my lips get exfoliated because I'm just like, mm, and then like <laughs> it sloughs off the dead uh, cells. So yeah. I only put it on once or I just use like super long wear lipstick, like mm. Fenty or uh, there's like a MAC one that's a liquid lipstick that stays on through anything. Ooh, like a stain? Yeah. Or something? Stains are so good. Yes. That's yes. what, actually, you know what? I bought a stain. I don't remember the company, but I bought a stain that was like a dark purple mm-hmm. and I and I messed up and then I tried to take it off and like it looked like I had bruises, like I couldn't get it off. It was so I got, I think I got to start with the stains that are a little lighter, uh, a little lighter or a bit more <laughs> yeah, a little forgiving. lighter. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I do find this one. Do you see my, uh, my anxiety? I literally brought it over here and then I was like, what am I going to do? Apply it on the fucking video? Like, no, that's not going to happen. But I find this Sephora is just like regular little brand. Like mm-hmm. they stay for a long time. I haven't tried it. Yeah, it's not as cool as like Fenty and Mac though. Like, let's just. Oh please! I just have like one Fenty one, and I was like, this is so expensive. But (laughs) I am probably gonna buy from her new skin line in a couple Mm. months when the hype dies down. Mm. Does that make it get like a little bit less expensive? Oh, absolutely not. But it makes it available. Oh, it's like I can just physically get one. I can one. physically buy one. Yes, that's gotcha. right. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Well, um, I'm so excited to get to know you better. I, I genuinely am like so freaking nervous. And again, this is not your – I was saying like before we started recording, like me being nervous is now – it's turning into I'm afraid that my guests are now feeling like they have to emotionally take care of me. So I'm 100% fine. <laughs> And I've just always been so intimidated by you. And I was listening to a podcast you were on where you were saying like, you get that, you've gotten that often, like, or before that people, why do you think people are intimidated by you? I am loud and a lot of people (laughs) are like, ah, so that, I think there's a couple of things at play, honestly. And a lot of it is because, you know, we are, a lot of us are, come to comedy and acting for a reason maybe we're a Mm. little bit socially inept and I think I'm not (laughs) and so we just do hang out with cohorts who have a bit of like social and um 
a little bit of social anxiety to an extent. Mm. And so I understand that I do come across very strongly. And I think people are often very surprised when a woman is just herself. Mm. And I think a lot of people, men, have mm. a lot of trouble with that because they're like, oh, I can't, I can't do what I want to do necessarily. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of it is that. And then I also have been thinking about it recently because I think about these things and mm. like, I'm an Asian, I'm a Filipino woman. And a lot of people have a lot of opinion, like just the preconceived notions of what Asian women are like and what Filipino women are like specifically. And it's very like um, docile and accommodating mm. and very like, oh yeah, 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 no problem, no problem. But that is not me. And so I think <laughs> just a little part of it could be maybe just not expecting an Asian woman to be as loud and as opinionated as I am. Or mm. maybe I'm just really rude to people, <laughs> which I can be. I don't know. I don't. Th- maybe you can be, but I don't think you're consistently rude enough for that to be the reason that. Pe- also, I was not intimidated by you because I thought, "Fuck, she's rude." Also, then I, then I wouldn't be like, "Please come on a podcast where I'm speaking with women that I admire." It's not. Imagine I start a podcast where I'm like, "This is 30 women that are rude to me. And I want to. I want to drink with them." Honestly, I think that's a great <laughs> idea for a podcast. Can you like? I think it would be a really interesting um sort of study on how we behave when we're with people that we're not really comfortable with because that changes Mm. right and like Mm -hmm. see if you can find that common ground automatically absolutely you will because talk to anyone for five minutes and you're like oh I was Mm. wrong and Mm. they were wrong and so now we're cool (laughs) Mm -hmm. I I think so much of like first of all just your feeling anxiety around other people or or people being rude to other people or whatever can be healed in a way from just like, okay, go sit with them for 10 minutes and talk honestly with them and put down your walls a little bit to whatever extent you're comfortable, you know, you feel safe and go figure that out and see what happens. And I think a lot of people have trouble with sort of, uh, especially with comedians, I find a Mm. lot of conversations are like bits, 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 let's Mm. joke, joke, joke. And obviously I love that, but I'm also, (laughs) I also don't, suffer like if I'm not into it I'm not gonna go in into your bits like it's a Mm. lot of energy and I think a lot of people haven't learned not how to turn it off that but they won't allow themselves to turn it off because of vulnerability Mm. and because they feel like they'll be judged or not liked so I, I I do get it but also like I'll just sit in a corner like this if I'm not having this conversation. <laughs> oh my god, I love that you bring up this this talking bits thing because I don't want to do bits. Like I if I just did a show, I just did the bits. Like I want to go Absolutely. out and talk to you as a person and often I just end up in a conversation where I'm like, oh, "Okay, I can't keep up. I'm just going to leave. Like I'm not funny enough for these people. I'm just and this is what they want. Ew, why did I just make that sound on a podcast? That was a disgusting choice." <laughs> but anyway, sorry about that. Nice to yourself. But, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. But I but it's just And then I end up being like, maybe I'm just too much for people. Like I would rather just sit and connect with a person and then let's do bits. Once we already have that relationship. Great. Let's do bits all day, but I don't want to get to know you through bits. I actually can't, I can't get to know who you are through bits. You nailed it. That's exactly why we do them because it allows us to present our funniest thing, which we've been told and conditioned that that's our best asset. So I completely understand why comedians are like, it's because that's their best part and they want to show that off Mm. but like I will say I would a lot of my really good friends have become my good friends because they are exactly like you and they're just like tell me why are you sad today Mm. and you're just like none of your business but then (laughs) but then they wear you down and then you're like yeah you're Mm. right why can't we just talk about this and I love that like Sarah Hillier is so good at just like getting to the root of the problem. Nadine mm. DeJury. <laughs> oh, she is the queen of like, how are you though? And at <laughs> first you you're just really? like, yeah. this is, I don't want to talk about it. But then you're like, yeah, what's wrong with talking about it? It's, it, it, it'll make everyone feel better. Like I'll feel better because then I will have confided in someone and then someone hears a real truth about you and you learn. Mm-hmm. So, And I think sometimes people are afraid of it similarly why they're afraid and me of of 
emotions. Like if you feel sad, you're afraid to feel sad because you feel like it will never end. But if you ask someone how they are, or if you're asked Mm -hmm. how you are and you answer honestly, it doesn't mean you have to talk about why you're sad forever. The conversation will end and then you can do a bit about it. Yes. But like you've connected and then it's cathartic if you trust that person. So yeah, I agree. Can I also just like acknowledge that you sort of a little bit said that your friends are like me and I, and I feel like I played it so cool, (laughs) but I was like, holy fuck. Did Anne just say that her friends are like me? I'm like, thank God I'm recording this and I can play this back. Like, thank God. It's so refreshing. (laughs) Like, honestly, I I would say 80% of sort of the Toronto community, comedy community are just bits and Mm -hmm. bless them like honestly it's like no judgment because again like I said it's rooted from just wanting to be funny and to show Mm -hmm. your worth where you're in a room full of people who you're probably very intimidated by you want to fit in I completely get it so but it's just refreshing to Mm -hmm. not have to do our jobs off stage yeah and I think that's what a big part of it too is is like I've been doing this for a long time. I don't, <laughs> if I'm not getting paid to be funny, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going to do gonna, it. Yeah. Oh, your bit. Do you want me to engage? Here's my rate. Here's my agent. You can talk to her. Yeah. My agent hey, yeah. number yeah. is 740003. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're right. Cause then it just feels like work. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, oh, you were able to just say it so succinctly. Like that was such a, yeah. Thank you for that. That was so right. wonderful. I also want to uh, chat with you. So you are about you are a uh self-proclaimed boy crazy (laughs) can I talk to you about boys absolutely absolutely (laughs) um okay are you dating anyone right now have you been dating during COVID do you even want to date right now yeah like how is that even possible yeah is it Skype dates like what do people do I have no well first of all some people just don't listen to hey yeah stay away for six feet yeah. some people are just ignoring that and I hate yeah. that but that's not my yeah. life yeah. I judge on, like a first date to I judge I judge it. It. But. I'm also like on a first date like first of all what if this person grabs your face you don't know and also you don't know where they've been and I don't even Absolutely. mean that sexually no. I literally mean that in terms of their mouth completely unromantically completely 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 I it's it's too hard and I also find like during all of this I am so emotionally raw and like I just am all over the place like up down up down this is not my best version <laughs> I, no one needs to no one should have to get to know this version of me you know what I mean right, right. yeah totally you're like I am ready to meet a mate what can I offer well I'm not leaving my house so good luck with that <laughs> yeah and also like I just I also don't like um the the apps I'm not into mm. the apps but also I'm not into dating anyone from comedy and so I don't date I work. <laughs> That's that is truly my truth. But like, I have crushes. Those are fun. But it's who's just... like the biggest crush right now? And you don't have to out someone that like we know personally. You can go celebrity if you want to. Uh, well, first of all, Zac Efron. <laughs> like... Oh my god! Yes. Okay. We. I tweeted you about this. Okay. I only watched one episode. I need to watch more. But what? I didn't know it was a thing that everybody's thinking he's like hella gorgeous he's in this show. So hot and like you could watch it on mute and be perfectly happy but you could also listen to it and then be mm-hmm. like oh, oh and you I really do feel like this show is showing the humanity of like a big Hollywood person who mm. obviously has come from a very sheltered like you know I childhood because he was acting since he was like a teen and he was a big heartthrob ever since like from a quite a young age it's interesting to watch this man who has for sure been protected very privileged like a certain upbringing um strictly in Hollywood I don't I don't uh assume to know what his childhood was like but like Hmm. you know you're in a bubble when you're in Hollywood I can only assume I've never been (laughs) but this is you seeing someone literally open their eyes to the rest of the world and to sort of the problems that are around it. And it's really refreshing that he cares to do something about it. And, mm. like, and you see that. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe he's just a really good actor and he doesn't care, but I don't. I feel like you're getting a pretty good look as to who he is and he's probably just like a very normal dude mm. and it's so refreshing and he's so hot. He's so <laughs> well, like hot. also just giving a shit about things or like a, a an interest in learning and bettering yourself is yeah. like one of the most attractive things about anybody. So yeah. that would make anyone even more hot if you didn't think they were hot to begin with. Yeah, he says something in one of the episodes and I was like, that is surprisingly quite deep and he basically something said along the lines of, um, you, what's the sense of having a lot if you don't have a purpose to your life? Like, what's the what's mm. success without purpose? And I was just like, that is a very, it's a very evolved way of thinking. Because this yeah. guy probably has, like, buttloads of money and, like, men and women throwing themselves at him. And he's he, he says, it doesn't matter uh, if you if if it means nothing like if there's nothing yeah. more to you than that then there's what else is there there's so much mm-hmm. more to life than just sort of your circle even mm-hmm. though we're all stuck in <laughs> quarantine <laughs> and we only have 10 people so what is there forever and ever forever. and ever yeah. forever okay well in general what are you what are you like in relationships like in friendships or or romantic relationships hmm. are you all in do you dip your toe in like what do you yeah I think I'm a very avoidant person oh wait did you is this like attachment theory I don't know it's just okay, I great. know <laughs> I just know yeah. what I'm like and what I'm like is like <laughs> don't talk to me if I'm mad like I'm that person who's like mm. if I'm mad you will know that I'm mad and I will not speak until I'm ready to speak just Mm. because like I have such a temper that I'm like, why would I say something right now? I would absolutely say something that I don't mean. And so I'm just going to not talk, but like also Mm -hmm. me being silently angry is not just a subtle thing. I'm like, (laughs) like you can feel my anger, which is probably why people are intimidated. (laughs) But, but just like, I, I honor my anger. I find Mm -hmm. a lot of people don't, but I also know how to handle it too. Um, And that is, (laughs) I love that. You're like, what do you like in relationships? And I'm like, anger, angry. I avoid people and you can feel my anger at all times. (laughs) And I'm like, you're so lovely. I want to get to know you. (laughs) (laughs) You're being so like, oh, by the way, I'm single constantly. I'm mad all the time. (laughs) Oh, what else? Um, But truly, like, Uh, I think you just have to know yourself. And I do think that's one of, that is the biggest thing, right? Because when we're in mm-hmm. relationships, yes, the good parts of you are the enjoyable parts and what we see 90% of the time. But like, I think a person is uh, more, t- like they reveal themselves more with their, like their sadness or their anger or mm-hmm. their darkness. And my darkness shows <laughs> itself and doesn't want my you to talk. Is another- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> my darkness says, shut up. Yeah. Well, I'm curious because, um, Again, I went into deep dive. I've listened to like, I think all the podcasts you've been on and read everything. Because I also, you know what? I just banged my table so hard. Another thing listeners are going to hate. I also just don't want to ask you stuff you've been asked before, Uh, partly, you know? I get that. um, Just don't ask me why, like if women are funny and then you can literally (laughs) ask any question. That is the one that I'm like, I don't know. We're not. not Yeah. Yeah, We're not. I hate that question more than anything in the world. Yeah, I guess I should take it out of my notes. It was my notes. No, Good one. Where's the Imagine two. Oh, yeah. Bye bye. Imagine two. Like, yeah. Are women funny? Because I'm wondering if I'm funny. Like, it's no. just so. Yeah, I fucking. There's a few questions where I'm like, I don't want it. Or just a few replies to questions like that where I'm just like, I don't even want to have to get in this conversation anymore. Yeah. And sometimes I also feel like I cannot. Like if a if I'm interacting with a man and they are talking to me about these kind of things, and sometimes I'm like, I. I don't want to speak on behalf of women right now and I can't adequately speak on behalf of them. So I'm going to let them down and then I'm going to reinforce that you don't think we're funny. Yeah. Fuck. Absolutely. So I don't want to talk about this. Completely. Completely. Like, ugh. Yeah. Um, but I heard you say, I feel like I'm echoing. Do you hear me echoing? I do not. Okay, great. Then maybe <laughs> I am and it's not there. Um, it is there. I'm going to validate myself, but I'm thinking like maybe it's just somewhere else. Also, um, okay, so you said in a podcast that with friends, um, like it's really hard for them to lose your trust and it's really hard for you to lose faith in them. And maybe that's not true anymore because it was a number of years ago. But I'm wondering 
what is, what's sort of that like breaking point? Like what's something a friend could do that's like, okay, that's, that's, I've lost, like I've lost trust in you. Um, I don't know because I haven't gotten there. <gasps> that's lovely. And that's because I think I am a very, like, I'm very, I don't want to say judgmental, but I'm very, I'm very, uh, I have a lot of boundaries. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I very much like, I love talking to people. I'm very open and I, and I'm very extroverted, but like, it takes a really long time for me to really, really trust people. And mm-hmm. so once you're in that circle, oh, you're not getting out. You're trapped. Mm-hmm. Sorry. <laughs> so like, I thought, I know, um, I was chatting about this with, a friend a couple weeks months what is time <laughs> oh yeah yeah whatever yeah, totally. yesterday last year and they were just and one of the things they said were like yeah I actually think you're one of the most loyal people and like I didn't necessarily think that of you but mm. I've come to learn that like I can kind of do and say whatever and that it will be se- I will still be seen and it um it's I wouldn't drop anyone for a small thing or or whatever like I just I like I don't know I think I have a really good judge of character and I just Mm -hmm. no one's lost my trust yeah yeah (laughs) well it also sounds like in order for for you to feel close with somebody like they gotta not pass tests that's such a bad analogy but but they're so you know to get there you've been Oh my God, it's like work. I've drank. No, exactly. It's Thank work. you. Thank friendship you. is so, work and like yeah. good, solid friendships. I don't necessarily, I've never found a fast friend that mm-hmm. has stuck around. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, and we all know those people. And again, no judgment because I think um, there's a lot of different reasons why we act the way we act with others. But for me, it takes a long time for me to fully trust but once it's there, it's like, it's there, it's there. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to, my friends don't really have to second guess that. And I don't think they do, but I just, I don't think, like, I think friendships are the most meaningful relationships you'll have outside of your family. Mm-hmm. And so for me, my friends are my family. And if you're family, you, you got to be down with like all the shitty, shitty, low, 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 <laughs> low, low things. Right. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that deserves to be rewarded in friendship mm-hmm. and in loyalty and in like just uh, respect and valuing your mm-hmm. friends. Mm-hmm. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yes. <know. laughs> yes. I think it's a beautiful answer to be like, I don't know, because I, Oh my God. What is the word that I'm thinking of? Falling vet? out? Yes. Vet. But I get vet. Like you, it sounds like in a very healthy way, like you vet the people in your life if they're going to become friends with you. So then once they're in, you're like, well, say that I don't need to like disband because I vetted them to be in this band. I yeah. think that's like an amazing, wonderful answer. And it also gives that person to be like, Oh, you're, I have to work too hard. No, thank you. And I fully <laughs> get that too. Filter, I yeah, filter out those that. people. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why too, that like, that's one of the reasons why I just don't enjoy dating and Mm. online dating because it is just a series of like, are you, are you a good person? And like, I'll put that time in with my friends, no problem. But with men, I'm Mm -hmm. like, I don't don't know. I don't, I don't trust men too much. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's not happening. Well, and I guess like, I wonder too, I'm thinking about this in dating, but also just like after shows and and people who have seen shows, like I know that, like you said, you're an extrovert. I feel like I'm an extrovert. I Mm -hmm. love to engage with people, especially in friendships. And there are a number of experiences in the past where like male friends who I thought we had a great mutual respect for each other have sort of crossed that boundary and misinterpreted, frankly, my kindness for consent to cross that friendship boundary when I'm like, and it leaves me questioning whether I sent wrong signals. And then event after a number of years, I was like, no, fuck this. Uh I'm being completely no. And I'm wondering for you, I so appreciate, like, I love seeing like your Instagram or your Twitter where you just like exude confidence and you love yourself and you're comfortable with like who you are. And on stage, like 
I'll never forget like the scene you did where you're like taking off all the Spanx and like, yeah. I wonder how do you navigate staying authentic to who you are in this like personable, like energetic, fun loving person. And then also keep your boundaries respected with other people. Ooh, that's a really great question. I actually don't know. I just have a very hard time. Sometimes I go one way and I just like, I stop being who I am and I'm just, I don't engage as much, even if I want to, to like send like quote unquote, like a bitch vibe so that they don't cross that boundary. Or then I just feel like I'm leaving myself vulnerable to basically lose all these friendships. I feel like when it comes to, it's, hmm, this is a great question, Amanda. Like, this is an amazing question. I don't know. I guess. Like, I am sure that you get guys, even without friendships, I'm sure, like, Guys are going into your DM, no. like, commenting on you. What? No. Okay, the only uh, here we go. What? Okay, here okay. we go. Yeah. The yeah. only men who drop, who slide into my DM, slide into your DMs, are yeah. literal men who like don't live in this country and uh, maybe have a passing knowledge of English. Like, okay, it's just random strangers, truly, yeah. truly, truly, and that's it. That's it. Those are the only men because I. As a woman in comedy, mm-hmm. I find it very interesting that when a man is very funny and like dynamite, dynamite on stage, women just like lose their minds. Yes. And it's like, oh, is he single? It's a race to get there first. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and we've all yes. been. They could be there. a hideous man, and everyone's like, he's so hot. It, com- yeah. it is upsetting. Story, men, I'm about to really drag you through the mud now. But like the most mediocre men become like hot studs yeah. Yeah. as soon as they show they're funny. Women, in my experience, do not get the same treatment. While I was working at Second City, I maybe got complimented once after a show. One man was like, hey, that was great. And it wasn't even to be like, hey, can I buy you a drink? It was just like, hey, you're really funny. That was really great. I've never, ever had a man come up to me after a show to be like, sup. I've never had that experience. Why do you think that is? Because I'm Whereas like like women. (laughs) (laughs) I think I'm scary to a lot of men. I think it's this idea of like, oh, she is so confident in herself. Mm -hmm. Mm, I couldn't. I couldn't go there. I yeah, don't like, know. What is the end to that sentence? I know I'm so like, I don't I'm like, know. I don't, what is so threatening about a confident woman? And this is something like I've tried to, I've thought about. So I'm like, what is, what, what is so scary about that? I don't get it. It's scary if you're not confident. It's scary if you're a small man who doesn't mm-hmm. believe in himself. It's a terrifying, yeah. and I think that's, that goes across all genders, really. Like mm-hmm. seeing someone in their power is either exciting and you want to be there and you want to like be around it, or mm-hmm. it's terrifying because mm. you know on the inside that you can't get away with your shit with this person. Mm. And I really believe that. And I think that's the type of thing I exude on stage um, and probably also in real life is this idea of like, Oh no, uh, you're not getting near this unless you're like top shelf. You know what I mean? Mm, and yeah. That's how I feel about my friends and that's how I feel about partners. And I don't, I don't like, you can sniff out a shitty dude. You know what I mean? Mm, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe they know it too. Yeah. And they I, like maybe, yeah. But again, I think like you have to ask the men that like, I don't know why I'm not getting a thousand phone numbers every single night. <laughs> Well, and I guess I wonder too, like I find sometimes like in the past, if I'm like this weird thing where like, I like to make jokes that are sexual in nature, like completely professionally, Mm -hmm. but I think those are funny or like whatever. And there have been times where like, if I'm doing an improv set and I made a sex joke or something, and then afterwards someone's referencing it and I feel like I have to say like, 
okay, just little footnote here. Like, I don't want you to hit on me. Mm-hmm. Like, like why? Yes. And, and I wonder how you navigate those boundaries or like, cause you don't want to walk around being like, I said it on stage, but not right now, <laughs> you know? Well, not in me, real life. I would say if this person is an audience member, like this has happened, like, uh, mm-hmm. I guess. So I guess I have been approached after shows and so what I will do is if they're an audience member, I will simply say, yes, thank you so much. Have a wonderful night and walk right away. Just, done. Just say yeah. thank you. I appreciate you. I'm out of here mm-hmm. because you don't know anyone your time. <laughs> if they're going <laughs> yeah. to only pick out the one like sexual thing you said in a 20 minute set that mm-hmm. tells you what they're listening to. Mm. If it's another improviser, <laughs> get out of here. I will literally say that. Which will probably, you really? Yeah. What? Well, like, get out of here. That's so dumb. That's so. Yeah. Like, who do you think you are? But again, yeah. no one's ever said that to me because that's exactly what I would say to them, and they know that. <laughs> but maybe that's just. Maybe I just need. I, I need people to think I'm scarier. I, like you said, <laughs> scary. I'm like, okay, great. I want to fucking be scary. Like I, that's what I want now. I mean. <laughs> I, <laughs> Maybe it's scary or maybe it's just boundaries and making them very clear. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think, and I wonder too, like, I really do think, again, like, I I don't know you, but my perception of you is like, I would say, yeah, she carries herself with like a fuck ton of respect for herself and she knows her worth. And I do think that those things emanate and show people how to treat you. And so definitely if you're walking around like, no, no, I know what I'm worth and I respect myself, then other people are going to be like, oh, fuck, like she's worth something and I need to respect her. D- does that make sense? Absolutely. Or it's like, oh, who does she think she is? Oh, well, genuinely fuck those people because th- that's just, yeah, that's just like, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Yeah. yeah. That's, but I don't yeah. know. Like I, and I also am the first person to admit to also like, I don't know. I don't know when people are hitting on me Mm. oh really? maybe it has happened I don't know I don't know because I feel like I've got good intuition and like I can feel when someone's vibing with me but they're not flirting but I'm like just get to the point already like what what is this about (laughs) like that's definitely happened like one or two times Mm -hmm. but I truly don't know because um I think I'm pretty cute and I'm pretty talented. So you tell me while I'm so Fuck single. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> and she pulls out and love it. Oh it's my God. So see me now. Is it hot? Oh my God. Also, like, look how shiny I am. Cause I also had, I turned off the air conditioner and mm. I'm sure my dog is pissed, but she's fine. Like I'm watching her. She's fine. <laughs> I just think it's going to be too loud. Um, okay. So I know once in the beginning of your career, when you were getting into comedy, I know you kind of said that like you sort of ended up finding yourself in these opportunities by accident, like sort of accidentally auditioning for sketch or sins or like yep. being like not auditioning for, I think it was Edco that your education company at second city, not auditioning and like getting cast. And so I'm wondering because I'm completely with no evidence of this. This is just how I would feel. Did you, what was your experience with any sort of imposter syndrome going in there? Or did you feel any at all? I definitely do. I think mm-hmm. that's something that, most women will struggle with for our entire careers because no, no. you know what I mean though because like do yeah. you ever find that like you you'll you'll hit a couple weir- weeks where you are flying high and you're like I'm the shit no one can fuck with me yes I am <laughs> powerful and so is everyone around me but then there's days where you're like do they know do they know do they know that this is all fake and that yeah. I just want to lie in bed all day long? <laughs> like, do they, <laughs> the fuck? Like, so, I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. And I yeah. think it's important to listen to those voices because it mm-hmm. kind of tells you sort of like where your heart is and what it needs right now, but also to not dwell on it because mm-hmm. men and the patriarchy uh, rely on you doubting yourself. And so for me, I'm like, who benefits the most from me feeling shit about myself? White men. And I Mm. don't want to give them that pleasure. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, yes, yes. And so I feel like my confidence is very much an act of rebellion. And so when I do get those moments of like, 
oh, I'm not that funny. Oh, I like, I think one of the things that I'm, my imposter syndrome right now is how it manifests is that I don't think I'm a good improviser. I just think I'm charming, but I'm like, what's wrong with that? <laughs> a lot of, a lot of people are good improvisers and they're not charming. And, and they're like, not charming. And I can name yeah. them, but I won't. Yeah. <laughs> I would also argue that you're both. Which well, like, you. whatever you like, of course it is. I'm validating how you feel, but also I'm going to be like, mm, I think you're a charming and you're a fucking fabulous improviser. I think you're both. And yeah. I think when you say it out loud to friends and to people you trust and the people that you respect, you will hear that back and you'll be like, oh yeah, okay, you're right. That was just me mm -hmm. kind of feeling like I need to be validated. And so mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot of imposter syndrome is. It's, mm -hmm. and it's completely understandable because there's so many people and forces and systems at play that want us as women and as people to feel shitty about ourselves because when we feel mm -hmm. bad about ourselves that's when we behave badly that's when we buy things so that we mm. make ourselves better or we make ourselves look like we're better you know what I mean mm, yeah um, absolutely yeah there was a quote that I read once, um, and I can't remember who said it, and I would love to credit them. Uh, they said something along the lines of like, if imagine imagine everything you could accomplish if you like stop doubting yourself, like all the time you spend doubting yourself, how much does that equate to a day? And sometimes if I am really going down that spiral, I'll just think like, okay, I could spend the next hour doubting myself or... I just gained an hour. What could I do? Should I watch a show? Should mm -hmm. I like create, like what should I, should I have a nap? Mm -hmm. Like I just was gifted an hour, but I do. Yeah. I think it's really easy. Cause while, while it's like, while we're busy doubting ourselves, then men can rule the world. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Yo, why do you think they put us in high heels? It's so we can't run away from them. <laughs> and that it takes us longer to get places. I'm yeah. sure on both airy on both ends there yeah. we don't have pockets yeah. so we can't carry things with us so we need <sighs> someone to do it for us I know I had some guy the other day I was at work and I had my apron on I'm a server sorry I have my apron on and a co-worker was like oh you brought your apron to this training I'm like yeah and he was sort of like acting like oh you're such a brown noser loser and I said yeah and also and I sort of fed into it because I was like then trying to play like the cool kid I'm like yeah it's great because it holds my phone and he's like well why don't you just put it in your pocket I'm like newsflash women's pants don't have real pockets so fuck you and then he's like put it in your bra and I'm like no I don't want it beside my boobs because I'm afraid that it will give me breast cancer, whether that's true or not. And then he started discrediting. And I was like, do you have boobs? Anyway, I just got Ugh. so frustrated with this guy. I was just like, whatever, get that guy out of my sucks. day. That he guy, does suck. He can't find conversations to have with people. So he just <laughs> criticizes them. That's he what it is. He criticizes that I'm wearing my uniform at work. I'm like, whatever, also, kid, stop get out of here. Don't talk about my bra. You're fucking gross, yeah. buddy. Don't tell yeah. me to put my phone in my bra. Yeah, yeah. ew. She'd be like, I'm not wearing one. No, anyway. I and was, then that, so and fine. then what will that conversation and then, turn yeah. into? Oh, yeah, exactly. He'll be like, well, you're the one who told me that you weren't wearing a bra. Yeah, anyway, <sighs> it's just, it's a lose-lose. It's always a lose-lose. Truly. You know, it truly, truly is. It really um, is. I'm also curious, like, in, so I'm just going to say, this is my opinion, but I'm saying it as fact, that, like, I truly believe that, yes, maybe you, it was by accident that you auditioned for these things, but, like, so deservedly so, because even as an outsider, you are one of, like, the most hardworking people that I can think of, Thank you. and you're also so fucking talented, and so I'm curious what your experience is like with any jealousy from people around you, maybe in like early days when you sort of were succeeding in these areas where maybe people had been trying for longer than you and hadn't yet succeeded? Like what were those experiences like? Oh, they were always with men. Always. Really? Always. And not with women. That nope. is so interesting to me. Nope, nope, nope. And maybe I wasn't paying attention or it wasn't brought to my attention, but any feelings of, oh, I should have had that has never come from any woman that I know, none, That's they've amazing. always been men. And the mm -hmm. one that comes to my mind <laughs> is when <laughs> I was in the Skechersons mm. and um, I had been on and off uh, doing the news, uh, co-anchoring the news with Brendan Halloran and mm. he was leaving the troop and he just gave me the news. And that's how it was. That's how he got the news from Bob Kerr before him. 
it's just passed down. There isn't a, hey, we should vote or we should mm. all have a say. It's whoever is at the news desk, they decide who to give it to mm-hmm. um, for whatever reason. And I remember, so I got it. The Everyone in the troop was told and a bunch of these dudes <laughs> immediately, like just we, there was a group email and just three dudes, I'll say, were just like, I don't think it's fair that Anne just gets it. It should be based on a merit system. It should be based off of seniority. It should be based off of na 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 And I'm just like, when has that ever happened in this troop? I was going to say, is that what happened with that guy or the guy before, the guy before that? Like, Absolutely not. It's never happened to any of the white dudes that was doing the news desk. And so I thought to myself, why that's not how that isn't how it's been done and yeah I actually really do understand where they're all coming from they wanted to try it because like it's a good way of honing a skill but the way they came at it was just so sexist Mm -hmm. and so entitled to me that like obviously I doubled down and was like nope I'm doing it by myself because I would have loved like honestly I would have loved that job is very hard to do to write copy Mm. jokes every week and it's what ultimately gets your brain ready for things like uh, 22 Minutes or Beaverton or other news satire shows. So I understand Mm -hmm. why all of these people really, really wanted it. But to come at it from a place of like, well, why does she get it? Rather than, hey, would you like to collaborate? Like if that had been said, I would have been so open to it. I would have happily, happily done a like, I'll be the co-anchor and then we'll just do rotating. Like a rotating, yeah. But I really would have loved to do that because A, it would have made my life a lot easier. And B, I'm not about to exclude people and like, I'm not trying to hold anyone down. But the fact that they thought that they were entitled to that made me be mm-hmm. like, no, sorry, I'm not doing it with you. Because yeah. they just felt like they should have gotten it over me. And because I'm like, they're men. because they're men. Yeah. And, then and that's I, the only thing it comes down to, really. Absolutely. Like- and I think back of like, I think of those three dudes who sent those emails being so like upset that it was just given to a woman. Mm -hmm. And I think about that when I got um, my job at 22 and those people didn't get those jobs. I think about that when I get Beaverton. I think about that when I get like second city, I think about that all the time. And that's the thing that drives me. It's this like, male entitlement that is around us it suffocates Mm -hmm. us in the toronto comedy community Mm -hmm. and it's only men because i tell you i've never felt this from women do i get oh i wish it'll happen for me absolutely because we're worse it's opportunities are so hard to come by in this Mm -hmm. in this fucking industry but Mm -hmm. it's never like I should get that over you. Over you. And that's the difference. Yes. Because I I mean, listen, jealousy is like a natural, as much as I might feel ashamed whenever I'm jealous, it's a natural emotion, mm-hmm. but it's, but your actions are up to you. There is room for me to wish that I got an opportunity and also be so fucking thrilled and think that my friend deserves it yes. more than anything. You know, you, those can coexist and it doesn't need to be, oh, well, I should have it over them. Yeah. Like, what is that energy? I don't know. It's, it's small thinking, right? Because that's Mm -hmm. very much a, there's not enough opportunity to go around. So I have to take this for myself. And Mm -hmm. that's like small minded thinking that this is the only thing for you. That's not true. There's Mm -hmm. a million opportunities at any given time. Mm -hmm. You'll find the right one or Mm -hmm. you'll work really hard to make yourself ready for when that opportunity comes knocking at your door. And I think Mm -hmm. that's what it is. So as much as I've stumbled but first into all of these opportunities and I really have I'm also ready because I've been working for so long and I work really hard and I keep focused and there's a lot of things in my life that I have sacrificed to sort of get where I am today in my career and Mm -hmm. that doesn't come with sitting at home being so sad that I didn't get x y and z it comes from Mm -hmm. oh I didn't get that okay well Clearly, I need to work on X, Y, Z. And then Mm -hmm. I'll go and do that. Or I'll be like, you know what? That wasn't for me. I don't really actually want it. I'm glad that whoever got that instead. Mm. It really is like, you have to be a little bit delusional to be an actor and to be a comedian. (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
and I lie to myself all the time. Like my, <laughs> my time will come. There will always be something for me. It'll work out. Yeah, but you have to because what you kind of have to. Like when I actually sit down and think of like the statistics of how likely it is that I will actually be able to make a living at this. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's why people leave. (laughs) So I have to ignore that. I have to, yeah, I have to stay a little bit delusional. And you know what? It's what helps propel you. Like I have always thought, like even from the beginning of uh, this path I'm like no I'm gonna be big and that's mm-hmm. the thing that sustains me when I don't get a job opportunity because <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't get <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah I I've achieved x y and z but there's also a b c d all the way up to x y and z that I didn't mm-hmm. get but we don't talk about that because what's the point we only talk about mm-hmm. our successes but like I've mm-hmm. failed many times see and that's like this feels sort of like sadistic to say, but it's very, it's nice to hear you say that because I think it's so easy to see you and like so many people at your level that, and I just think, yeah, they get everything and deservedly so like they're fucking killing it. But of course, I mean, you're not going to go on Instagram and be like, well, didn't get that one. I don't know why I like purposely went to my phone like that. But you know what I mean? Like, of course, and you're going to share that with your close friends when you're disappointed. You know, Instagram is curated, like everybody knows that it's been said a million times, Uh but it does you have to remind yourself because it's very easy, especially like I so often feel like everyone around me is uh, succeeding and fulfilling their career and doing everything. And I'm just stuck right here, like trying to pedal, working hard and I'm not making any movement. Yeah. You know? And so. But that's not the reality. Yeah. Like the reality yeah. is we get rejected 99.9% of the time. We only mm-hmm. show the point one part of us succeeding because yeah. then we would be on our phones every day talking about how brutal that last audition was <laughs> and how much you so did true. not come prepared for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or even you'd be sitting there being like, well, another day where I didn't get an audition. Like no one's going to do that either. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. You said that you've had to sacrifice a lot. I'm I'm wondering like, what's, what's something that you've sacrificed that was sort of like the hardest one to decide to sacrifice? For sure a relationship. Like I've been single oh. my whole life. Yeah. And that's because I will not settle for garbage. <laughs> and yeah. unfortunately, sorry, a lot of the men in our community just don't live up to the standards mm. that I hold. And you know what? Yep. Maybe I deserve to be knocked down a couple of pegs. But mm-hmm. it's it's not even a matter of like, you're not good enough or whatever. It's like, who do I think would be compatible? Mm-hmm. And there's like... I, I, I am surrounded by incredible human beings. And so I already know what it feels like to be treated amazingly by my friends and by my family. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to not settle for that. Like I know mm-hmm. what I want. I know how I want to be treated and mm-hmm. I deserve to be treated well. And it's not to say that men have treated me poorly, but it's like, I would rather you know, be at home watching a, a show or like writing in a journal or going out and doing a show rather than being on a dating app. Mm-hmm. And like that's a pretty, for me, that's a big sacrifice. Cause like mm-hmm. I'm well into my thirties and I haven't had a, um, a meaningful romantic relationship with anyone. And so I'm like, mm-hmm. Oh, when will it happen for me? But I'm also just like, I've had a really fun fucking life. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's fine. Well, and I'm sure it's hard too. Like if you don't want to date anybody in the comedy community, which I totally understand. And then you are so like hardworking and busy. Like you're always doing shows or you're always booked on something. Yeah. It's like, when the hell is there time to meet people anyway? Yeah. And I also like, find oh like being on the apps and sort of like chatting with people it's a form of being on. It's a form of entertaining mm-hmm. someone. And when that's already our job, it's so hard to have to like do that outside of a stage. And yes. it's a lot more it's a lot more work and it's a lot it is it's a very vulnerable thing to go and meet people and go on dates and I'm not that vulnerable. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that that's, I guess, a big fault of mine is that I'm very closed off. I'm angry. Mm-hmm. I'm closed off. What else? <laughs> Um, constantly single. Yeah, just, it's so funny you've said all these things about yourself, and I'm like, I don't see that at all. And then you'll say to me, you're like, you got to be better to yourself. I'm like, and you called yourself rude, scary. <laughs> although, although to be honest, I feel like scary doesn't feel like I feel like scary is like fuck. I want to be scary. Like I don't know. I see scary as like maybe because I like scary spice, but I think because scary is like. I think it's always the grass is always greener. You know. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Yes. Because, Anne, can I tell you? Okay. So I, I am in a long-term relationship with someone we've been together for 13 years. So oh, like wow. basically almost, now, yes. And oh. I adore the hell out. Like he's just the most wonderful human being. Honestly, he is. And when you say that, when you're like, I haven't been in a relationship because I've been focusing on my comedy or, and, and my, not just comedy, my whole artistry, a tiny voice inside is like, oh my God, are you, should you have done that? But I don't want, but then, but then I always go to, I'm like, oh, not should I have done that? Because, but almost the little voice of like, oh, she, this is what it is. It's, oh, Anne is more of an actor than you are because she was willing to sacrifice. And in my head, I'm like, I don't want to sacrifice this person who I adore and love, but the grass is greener. I think it is. I think we can get in our head about like, Oh, should I have done that? Does that would that have made me a better performer? And I'll say this: it's so funny that you say that exactly because the way I feel about it is like, mm-hmm. how can I tap in to those emotions of love and th- those things like that, like you know, um, for acting, if I mm-hmm. haven't felt that? So I feel like I'm at a loss because I haven't mm-hmm. gone through the motions of what it is to be like in a relationship, and so mm-hmm. it it really is a fine balance of like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've gotten this far without um, focusing on relationships, but there's also a really big deficit. Like, mm. I'm playing it off very cavalier, but like, it is lonely, and especially in times of quarantine and COVID, when you are truly limited to a specific number of people you can see, there yeah. you do get isolated and you do feel lonely, mm. and that's there. Like, that's always mm-hmm. there, but it's also not the thing that will drag me down for an extended period of time because Mm -hmm. I know how lucky I am in other regards and it's always important to remember that like Mm -hmm. you know what I mean like so there's like a lonely little part in my heart but she also gets to go to Croatia and Berlin on her own so oh my god and your travel posts in your Instagram like in some level no, the op- I am truly just living vicariously. And your outfits and your bathing suits are always so beautiful. I swear. I'm like, does she have a designer that just like makes all of these? Like, how does she find all these beautiful prints and these beautiful cuts? Like, yeah. And it's so funny because like, I didn't wear a bathing suit up until maybe I was 27, 28. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's like... Th- it's so funny because mm-hmm. I know sort of the the broad picture that I present to the world, but like mm-hmm. I didn't, I wasn't born this way. <laughs> like it's taken <laughs> years of work and like patience and self reflection and being kind to myself to get to the point where I am now. And Mm -hmm. so now I can be like, "Mm, like in my little cute bikini, but like in my twenties, when for sure I had a smaller body, I was like, no, nobody wants to see that. I don't want to see that. That's gross. I couldn't possibly get away with it. But the older you get, the more you learn, the more um, willing you are to open your eyes to like different forms of beauty and how like different bodies are beautiful no matter what that takes years Mm -hmm. to undo all of the hardwiring of fat is bad fat is ugly um which is like programmed into our dna as human beings like it's everywhere right and so like it, it it takes work and you have to be aware that that messaging is out there And I don't think Mm. I clued into that until I was in my mid twenties. When I started Mm. reading things like Shrill by Lindy West, and I was like, what a revelation this book is. But like Did you like the show? Did you see the show? I love it. Okay, book or show, book or show. What did you Well they're different, right? They are. They are very different. Yes. So that was such a yeah, so good. It was. It was so Yes. Sorry, I interrupted you because I Yes, that's (laughs) such a good book. Such a good book. But that's what it is. It takes and so 
I found that while I was working on myself, that helped my career also take off because mm-hmm. to be successful in comedy, you kind of have to have a voice and you have to know what you want to show the world and also know what the world sees of you. Right. Mm. So I think that's another big part of my success is because people see what I look like and they already have these preconceived notions as to Mm. what an Asian woman will be on stage, what a fat woman will be on stage, what a fat Asian woman will be on stage. They're like, "Eh." and then the second I do anything that will counter that people are like, "Ah!" they're so (laughs) impressed. And you're just like, you're so dumb. <laughs> like, I know what you look, you, I know when you see me, you think I'm quiet or submissive and mm. I just have to not be one of those things. And automatically your mind is blown. <laughs> I have to be confident. That's all I have to be. And people are like, Oh my God, she's so confident. Good for her. And so the messaging behind that is also like, why wouldn't I be confident? And that's what I was just going to say. Like, how does that ever bother you because to me I'm like what do you why is it impressive that she would be confident like that feels like a backhanded compliment do you know what I mean well, not do you know what I mean mm-hmm. I shouldn't be yeah it absolutely it's your experience that. you're talking about and I'm like do you want do you get it <laughs> like fuck sorry that's not a way to no, say that. no no I absolutely get it and like I used to care a lot but then mm-hmm. I'm like well what do my family and what do my friends think of me mm-hmm. that's important mm-hmm. If I made you laugh, good. You got your price of admission at this show that I'm performing on. But I don't owe anyone anything else other than that. If people get more, amazing. That means they've connected and they were able to see themselves in me. And I think Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge part of it too. So it's like, at first I would be like, well, why why shouldn't I be confident? But then Mm -hmm. sometimes the people who are saying those things and thinking those things are women who are exactly like me and they don't know any better. And so Mm -hmm. if I can make them believe for one second that like a fat woman can be fucking awesome, then maybe Mm -hmm. they'll believe that about themselves. Mm -hmm. So at first it was like, ugh, fine, I guess I'll take your compliment. And then it turns into, yeah, man, and you are too. You're equally as awesome. So Mm -hmm. what's up? Fuck, and you should be like a life coach. Like you should. I, don't know I really you, shouldn't. Like, my, my room God. is disgusting. No, <laughs> it's truly. I have like Please. old food everywhere. Just a bag of like junk food right here. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen. I'm pretty sure I did not fully clean up all the palm bays that have that. I also think I'm saying bays, palm bay palm that bay. spilled all over my entire apartment. Um. <laughs> This is sort of like a heady question, but when you were talking, I thought like you mentioned like getting to know your voice and like you have to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes, okay, so this is a very chicken and an egg thing for me. Um, I don't know what the fuck my voice is, but I don't want to be an artist like I am. That's just, that's taken a very long time for me to be like, no, 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 you're not aspiring like you are. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what my voice is. And I used to think, well, I need to figure it out first and then I have a right to creating. But I'm like, but wouldn't, don't I figure it out through creating? And I, I get, and then I get so confused that then I just sit down and watch Bob's Burgers because I get like so overwhelmed. So like, yeah. what do you, yeah. How, what was your sort of experience or process in like figuring out your voice? That's a loaded fucking question, but. No, it's a great one. I would say working towards getting Second City is what helped develop my voice. Because Ooh. I like literally work for their children, like not their children's show, their education. Child company. Co. Yeah, children it is co. Yeah. yeah. I did that for five years and I'm like, why aren't I getting ahead? Why aren't mm. I moving up? What is what is going on? And then so like, you know, you would take a meeting with the producer to ask for feedback, and of course it's full of shit. But, mm. you know, um how, it it really was, okay, well, if I'm not getting Second City, then I have to find success somewhere else. And that doesn't mean mm-hmm. I'm going to quit Second City because it's a job and why would I give up money? Mm-hmm. Um, so I did things like the Sketchersons. And when you have to write a sketch every single week, minimum one sketch, you quickly find what you think is funny, what Ooh. you write again and again and again, and then what people cast you as. And like, what is the void? Like, 
when someone else is writing and they cast you in something, what is that character? Who are, what are they about? Sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes you're just getting cast as uh, just child number three in a daycare scene. But sometimes, like a lot of the times I would always get sort of like, uh, like the one making like the smart ass comment or Mm. whatever. And then I would Mm. be like, oh, okay. So people see me as like sort of a sassy person who can get away with saying some like kind of mean thing (laughs) and I took that to heart and you 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 just learn Mm -hmm. through creating Mm -hmm. but it was just it's through creation that you figure out what your voice is because I definitely didn't have a voice when I started at the Skechersons and then after doing it for four and a half five years you 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 figure it out (laughs) you figure it out yeah you figure it out yeah and even when I started my career I didn't I was like absolutely the person who was like I don't want to do political comedy I just want to be funny and then Mm -hmm. you're like that's stupid (laughs) but I don't I don't begrudge anyone who wants to but for me I look at who I am my opinions and the fact that like if I have a platform I want to use it and Mm -hmm. so how can I incorporate my comedy into what I want to say and that's what your voice is right the things you Mm -hmm. care about off stage finding their ways on stage that's what your voice is the things that you keep bringing up in improv scenes the things Mm -hmm. that you keep writing about the things you keep joking about like you you know what it is sometimes you just don't want to see it because you're scared and sometimes you're just not paying into it or paying attention to it because you don't see the value in it but I I think everyone kind of knows what their voice is and not every voice is political too right some people are quite absurd and that's their voice and there's it's not any less uh valid than someone who focuses on political satire Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. I I often find I often feel like very inferior to people who can um just whip out like a topical reference or like who who are really good at crafting political satire actually and it's made me um turn down shows like because I'm like nope I'm not good enough for that or like nope I'm not going to be able to rise to that occasion not doing it not doing it um and that's only in the last little while that I and it's only because someone else said it to me it wasn't even my own idea that just like you can be just as valid and not do political satire right now Mm -hmm. like that's okay yeah you know so yeah because you know as a woman in comedy it is we are political we are inherently political by just being and taking up space in a very male dominated industry mm. that like that is our pov that w- that is what our voice is to be a woman or a person with the experiences behind us like that is our voice right everything that uh, has led you to being on that moment uh, on that stage at that moment and sometimes it's silly goofy like I would I would say that my voice is as horny as it is like (laughs) as sort of socially like uh socially uh commentary you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. I love talking about um my gender my race Mm -hmm. and my body but I also love you know like being a dirty little troll and being like give me your pubes you know (laughs) Yeah. And that's not any less valid than when I make a comment about uh, the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah. Different You're like pew political, you know? Pew like, political is pube absolutely political. making a comeback. <laughs> because yeah. in quarantine, none of us care about our privates. Uh, <laughs> like anything. Like sometimes I'm like, when was the last time I washed my hair? Oh, this or was like, like changed a shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I've been wearing <laughs> yeah. this dress for three days straight. And I, don't I love care. the floral dress, though. No, with the cool. headband. I will show you. It's like so nice, <gasps> and it's from. Oh, it has a, is that like feathers on the bottom? I don't know. Let's or some beautiful color too. It's stunning. It's from Anthro, oh. and look- <laughs> I paid enough for like it, so I'm gonna wear it. <laughs> You're like I'm showing off the whole thing. You look like yeah. you should be in Greece or something. Oh, I wish. Maybe that- because you're always traveling in my mind. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> How is she able to accomplish so much here in her profession and also be traveling the world? Like, what oh, is happening here? <laughs> I literally, like, I, I just look for those breaks and I'm like, 
well in advance. I'm like, when is the first yeah. time I can like leave? Because I didn't always uh, travel so much. Like I didn't travel mm-hmm. in my teens and in my twenties because I couldn't afford it. But yeah. then I started working a bit more and I was like, I deserve a break. And there's no mm-hmm. better way to actually stop working than to physically remove yourself from the country. Yes. And that's yes. what it came down to. Like after I left mm-hmm. Second City, I literally left the country for two months. I went to Asia for two months. That was the only thing that got me stopping, that that stopped me from working. Because as soon as I got back, I was so worried when I was like in a, traveling through Asia being like, oh, where's the next job going to be? Mm-hmm. Because as a comedian, you're like, well, Second City was like the top job to have for live performance. So when I got back, I'm like, oh, I really got to figure out, well, I got, well, am I going to write a show? Am I going to, am I going to work on a fringe show? Am, am I, like, what am I going to do? And then She the People happened and then 22 Minutes happened and then Bob Curry happened all at once. And there was a wow. eight week period where I was doing three jobs. <laughs> and so I was doing all three of those at the same time. And from like mid August to mid September, I was doing um, Monday to Friday, uh, 22 minutes. And at that time, the office that I was working out of was in the East end and I would have to drive in and out of rush hour. So I was in traffic for an hour and a half, both ways. So for three weeks I had to do that and then finish up the directing of the Bob Curry, the second city, like diversity and inclusion, um, program that had to also be, I had to go to rehearsals. I had to figure out a running order. Uh, Thank God I had my beautiful love of uh, my life, uh, Brandon Hackett, who was one of my best friends Mm -hmm. in the whole world, helping me co-direct that. And then She the People on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturday, Sundays. It was intense. And then I was doing double duty of uh, 22 and She the People from September until December. And as soon as that happened, I'm like, mommy gonna go to Paris. (laughs) I was gonna say, there needs to be a bookended like trip right there. And that's how I do it. Like, I just, I'm like, you work really hard. You get to play really hard. I very much believe in rewarding yourself because it is the thing that keeps you motivated to keep working is like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I love my job, but I'm also like, okay, but I need to make money to go on my next trip. So (laughs) let's, let's do it. Let's, let's book a commercial. (laughs) Exactly. Well, and actually I remember you had said, um, that the process of creating a second city main stage show was like really hard, like gut wrenching, like jokingly so, but maybe also not so no, jokingly. Like, dead serious. Like, <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering, like, what made you keep coming back, like doing three shows? Like, what made you come back each time, other than money, I guess? But like, you know, <laughs> money. Because I mean, because you could have been paid for. You. Yeah, yeah, money. One, money. <laughs> yeah, Fear yeah. of not having another job as good as that. Number two. Yeah. Number three, I didn't feel like I was ready to go. Like after my third Mm -hmm. show, it was, I I could probably stick around for one more or I could leave on a high note. Mm. And so I went with leaving on a high note because Mm -hmm. the job is grueling. And it's so funny because a lot of people have a lot of opinions on Second City and Mm -hmm. sort of the Second City process and how people behave while they're at Second City. And Mm. for me, unless you've actually done that job, you have no leg to stand on. You Mm. can't comment. You can't judge. You have no idea how hard it is because people think it's just like, oh, yeah, you're just improvising. But what you don't realize is, yeah, you're improvising, but you're being asked to improvise about things you care about. And so Mm. then you're not only bringing up these feelings about topics and scenarios that you care deeply about but you're also being critiqued on them and you're being told, well, that joke didn't land, but you're like, but that's sort of the whole point of the whole sketch. So I don't shit. So then does my experience not matter? Like it's a lot of invalidating Mm. feelings and feelings that just are inherent to making a show. Um, Mm. And so people, it, you are your worst self when you are at second city And nobody knows that unless you've done it. And so I hold a lot of space for people who have made mistakes, unless we're talking about like (laughs) straight up abuse, then I don't have um, patience for that because I've been through it and I didn't abuse anyone. Um, Mm -hmm. That's another topic that maybe we don't (laughs) want to talk about. (laughs) But like, 
it's it's uh, it's so hard that job because mm-hmm. you are every day forced to bring your most authentic self and mm-hmm. you are being judged on that and so it's mm-hmm. every day you're being judged on things that are deeply personal and sometimes you have audiences that love it and eat you up and you feel seen and then sometimes you do a job for a a show for like I don't know like an accountant company and everyone is coked out and like yelling take off your shirt and you just want to set the building on fire (laughs) or they're yelling take off your shirt and you're like fuck in the next scene I have to take off all my clothes great girl yes yes yeah. And then you're like, you go backstage and you're like, Hey, by the way, we're cutting that scene from tonight. But then you're like, no, fuck it. I'm going to do this. Scene. It would be such a mind fuck. I think for me to do like, I, I have such respect for people who go through that process because I can't imagine, like you said, coming in, well, I, I genuinely can't imagine, but the idea of coming in and basically the question on the table is like, who are you? What do you uniquely offer? Yes. Okay, perfect. We're going to take the essence of you and we're going to package it. And then we're going to compare it to the package of the person beside you. Uh, you know what? We're feeling like this one's better right now. Okay. Come in with 10 more ideas of who you are and what you believe in. And 1, I'm like, thousand percent. Like, and added, I can't imagine to added the pressure on of, even if it wasn't a dream to be on the second city main stage for years, I mean, I'm sure for people, it was a goal for a little bit at least. Mm -hmm. And once you get it, it's exciting. So the added pressure of like, is this what it's like? Or like, is this what it's just like for me? Like, yeah, wow. Like Like, people have no idea how difficult the job and what it demands of you. And Mm -hmm. that's why it's like only only a few people get to know what that job is. And Mm -hmm. that's sucks everyone should get a shot at it but it's also like not everyone could actually do the job and I really Mm. really believe that Mm -hmm. (laughs) now Mm -hmm. do I believe that people can be supported and um, be given resources so that they can absolutely but there's also just like you have to know what you want out of yourself and out of your comedy to do that job Mm. Mm -hmm. well and I wonder so I I also I feel like I just keep quoting you which like maybe that's so weird but I was just listening like I want to ask you about this and I want to ask you about this well that's also the thing is I'm not going to be like remember in 2016 when you had this pot when you were on this podcast okay so I'm just going to ask you about that like no um but you had said you had shared that like being out on the second city main stage and performing a show and seeing someone in the audience who clearly feels so seen by you, by you in your performance, um, like makes so many, so much of it, like so worth it for you. Uh I'm wondering like, what's a moment that you remember feeling so seen when you were watching a show? It could be TV, it could be a movie, it could be on stage, whatever, whatever comes to mind. I don't know if it was me feeling seen as much as it was Mm -hmm. me being like, this is what Second City could be. It was when I went to Mm -hmm. Chicago for the NBC Breakout Fest. Um, We, I went with Brandon Hackett and Scott Yamamura after our uh, Bob, our first Bob Curry showcase, we got to go to Chicago and present a, a couple of scenes for that showcase for NBC and I also got to see for the very first time in real life a Second City ETC show. And it was um, Soul Brother, Where Art Thou? And it is, mm. to this day, one of the most like life-changing shows I've ever seen. Because it was the first time I had seen um, Rashawn Scott, who is an incredible alumni of Second City. Um, she does a scene where... Actually all of the women in the the cast, so Lisa Beasley and um, Carissa Barreca, they literally take off their clothing and like get into like onesies. And it was so like empowering. And the whole, that was just one scene, but like the whole show was so like in your face and so aggressive. And it wasn't like a Second City Toronto show, which is sometimes Mm -hmm. a little bit more passive and less like, Mm -hmm. I don't care if I piss you off. Um, I didn't know it could be like that. I didn't know mm-hmm. you could do a whole scene and not try to make a joke. Like mm-hmm. it opened my eyes as to what I could do. And th- so then I did feel seen because I was just about to start main stage in a couple of weeks. And I was like, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to bring to Toronto. This idea of like 
I'm just going to be myself and I'm going to be powerful and I'm going to try to challenge my audience. And that mm-hmm. was the first time I saw a, a Second City show really challenge an audience. And um, I didn't look back from then. That really informed how I treated uh, my work at Second City, which was, you don't have to laugh at me, but you have to at least think about what I'm saying. And I, I mm. think I managed to do that with the three shows that I did at least once uh, in each show. <laughs> and so, and I completely attribute that to Soul Brother, that Second City wow. EPC show. And that's what made me be like, oh, women are taking off their clothes. I want to take off my clothes. <laughs> I'm going to take off my, I know. And then the the scene, which we've already referenced, which is take it off, where I just take off, like, it's a strip scene, but then I just peel off layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of Spanx. <laughs> yeah. the, I have never felt more like a rock star than when I do that scene. And I see women all over the audience just being like <laughs> losing it losing it the best is when like middle-aged white women are just like they're they're shaking they're shaking <laughs> and they're just like slapping their husbands and they're just like yeah this is me like you know you you know you've done a good scene if someone in the audience is like yes 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 like on like that's head. me that's yeah, yeah. oh yeah. God, that sounds so fucking rewarding. It's, that is amazing. Yeah, and so like, yeah, yeah. As much as it is like, you hate it when creepy dudes are like, yeah, take off your shirt, and then the very next scene you have to take off your shirt. Mm-hmm. Also, you're not. Even though I do take off my shirt, it's the least objectifying way yeah. possible. Like I am fully in control of what's happening, and that yeah. to me is like the best. Like, fuck you, buddy. It's like <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna take off my shirt. But I'm gonna yeah. show, I'm gonna show you the layers, uh, literal layers of yeah. what it takes to be this. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's like I'm gonna take, yeah, I am gonna take off my clothes layer by layer. But you and everyone else in this audience is gonna know it's not for you. It's for me and all the other people who are like seeing themselves yes, in me right now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's that, I didn't even think of that, and that's such a great. It's such a like. Oh, you want me to take off my clothes? Cool. Fuck you. Here I go. You yeah. know, like God, it must feel. Yeah, so empowering. Yeah. And we had a similar scene like that too in our third show with Alana Riach and Nadine DeJury where we also strip off our clothes. I take my clothes off a lot. <laughs> and that's me trying to force the world into like, hey, you have to look at my body. Sorry. Um, not sorry. You're welcome. <laughs> it's, yeah, you're, you're welcome. welcome. You to look yeah. at it. But yeah. in that too, like the first couple of moments when we're just standing in our bra and our uh, shorts, the men are like, ah! going crazy and and yeah. we let them go crazy until they're like uh why haven't they said anything <laughs> and then we get into a scene that's literally turning our bodies t- shifting it from the objective of the the objectifying gaze into like hey you you love these boobs well guess what it, my back hurts and this one is bigger than the other and <laughs> popping out oops yeah and there's a real like well that's not sexy anymore <laughs> it's, a real, it's a real nice feminist like suck it yeah I oh I love that. that I think I saw that show with my dad and I remember we were just like cheering along yeah. yeah I think it was that show it was a show you were in and I'm trying to remember which of the three but I think it was that one because I think he was with me yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I loved it. Um, I know often at Second City, uh, you guys get some celebrities popping by. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what celebrity was the most different than you thought they were going to be? I, okay. Mm-hmm. What's his name? Oh, I'm going to be such a, the drummer from Green yep. Bay. So oh, it's not gosh, wait. Billy Joe okay. Armstrong. It's. no. Nope. Let me Google I, it. Drummer from, and you know what? Listeners, if oh, you can hear me, listen, it, we're doing it all. Okay. It just shows three names. It shows, wait, Trey Cool. That sounds odd. Uh, John Kiffmeyer, or I got Raj Punjabi. Oh my gosh, I think I lost you. Anne? (gasps) 
Anne? <laughs> oh no, what should I do? Ah, technical difficulties. Aren't they fun? While I try and figure out what happened and get reconnected with Anne, I want to take this time to thank a few people who helped make this episode possible. A big shout out to Shehang Ma, Tracy Hamilton, Matt Ardill, David Guthrie, and Stephanie Rice for their help this week. I really appreciate it. Okay, now back to chatting with Anne. God, I hate that every time. It doesn't even Anne like show up back. on mine. <laughs> oh, it doesn't? It doesn't it's not on show. my phone, no. No, no. Oh, on your phone. You're like, no, it's not happening. <laughs> oh, yeah, because your phone would only be your voice. Yes. Dude. What a nightmare this would my be. God. <laughs> Well, I'm excited. I'm excited to hear it. Um, and we're back from possible technical difficulties, but we don't know if it's even a difficulty and it's just opportunities for getting, for growing. Yes. It was so. a learning moment and we yeah. take it. We say, thank you, universe. You can't thank hold us down. No, you know what the universe gifted me is like a little 10 second conversation off air with Anne while we figured everything out. And that was beautiful. And we got Talk to chat. Bras. Talked, talked about, about bras. bras. We talked yep. about bras. We talked exactly bra fittings. Um, <laughs> the real well, I, stuff. The real. <laughs> yeah, seriously, that's in like the Patreon bonus <laughs> episodes. <laughs> do you have a Patreon? I do not because I don't okay. understand it. Baller. I would have been so like, wow. <laughs> I wish no. I could have one. No, I don't. I don't fully understand it. And also, here's the other thing. I thought about a Patreon. I'm like, well, what would I offer? And then immediately I was like, Amanda, we don't talk to ourselves that that way anymore. We have a lot to offer. So now, no, you're not going to talk about like you have nothing to offer the world. But then I'm also like, I, I'm not at that point yet. It's so funny because I keep <laughs> asking my friends. I'm like, can I start an OnlyFans? Except I don't show my boobs. I just talk shit about people openly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel like them. a lot of people would honestly I feel like a lot of people would sign up for Absolutely. your fans only without even knowing what it was like not even knowing what they're in for I would sign up for your only fan fan only only fan only fans I don't know only yeah, fans only fans yeah only yeah. fans well it might still happen I don't have jobs and I keep saying no to auditions because I'm a very bad actor <laughs> I keep being like, oh, I don't feel oh. like do. I don't feel like getting up today, Carly. I can't. I don't wanna. So ow. bad. Ow, ow, <laughs> life, ow. Uh, Sometimes, yeah, it's so funny. I have such a love hate relationship because, like, I get, I, I'm like, oh, I want an audition so bad, and then you get one, and there's always this tiny bit of dread of like, oh, okay, and then I think this is all you wanted. Like, what is going? Yeah. Regulate your roller coaster yeah. of emotions. Like, absolutely. And then I'll do the self tape. And in the beginning, I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Then I get into the groove. Oh my God, this is so fun. So like, fun. I'm loving, this, loving it. And then I send it off being like, oh my God, like SNL call me. And then I hear nothing. I'm like, great. <laughs> great. Now we're back again. Yeah. And I'm a piece of shit. And then I think, okay, no, it, next time, listen, you can do this. And then I wait for a self tape or an audition. And then it happens all over again. Yep. <laughs> See, just the these cycle. are the things that we do not post on yes. Instagram. We don't post the things that were like, ugh. I yes. had food in my teeth that whole self tape. Uh, <laughs> I'm not redoing it. I'm sending it. Oh yes, that's so true. Yeah, just it's like oh, it's just going. Or like oh, I misinter I misinterpreted this entire character. It's okay. a choice. Here we go. That's my artistic voice. There you yep. go. There it is. Um, okay. Well, before our technical opportunity that we were given, um, what a we wonderful were way of putting it. <laughs> technical opportunity. <laughs> technical opportunity for growth, connection, and learning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was asking you about um, at Second City on the main stage. Often you have celebrities come visit, and um, I had asked you. And sorry if the, no, I'm not sorry. I was going to be like sorry if this wasn't a technical opportunity because then you're rehearing the question. But I deserve this real estate right now in this yes. in this in this Take up podcast. Space. Yeah, we're taking up space here. Um, <laughs> celebrities come, and I was wondering which celebrity was the most different than what you thought they were going to be at yes. Second City. Uh, that would definitely go to Trey Cool of uh, Green Day. And it was just because, like, he was so nice. And he Aww. was, like, he loved the show. Like, sometimes when we, like, first of all, I didn't meet that many people, but I did meet a Blue Jay, so that's all that matters. And you, huge fan, right? Of Blue Jay? fan. Like, massive. Huge fan. Like, yes. huge. And I, like, this is another story, but I I fell into my locker and cried five minutes before the start of the show because our stage manager, Meg McGuire, was like, 
do you guys want to know if there's someone famous in the audience? And we were like, yes. And she just looks at me and she's like, uh, she you should sit down. <laughs> she knew. No, and she then I started, knew. I was, cr- I was hysterical. <laughs> anyway, it was Kevin Pillar, uh, best day of my life. Anyways, Trey oh. Cool. Trey, back to Trey. Yeah. Back Trey to Trey Cool. cool yeah, the back drummer to Trey. from Green yep. Day. Like, because when celebrities come backstage, sometimes they don't care at all. And they're like, yeah, yeah. We know that this is only for a photo, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But he was just so genuinely like, whoa, that was so cool. You guys, I don't know how you do it. It's a meet. Like, he was just so positive and so nice. And he was touring with Green Day and he had the night off. Um, and the next stop on their tour was going to be uh, like Montreal and then Chicago. But mm. the cast of that show was also going to Chicago. So we were, he was talking about how like the next tour dates, uh, they're going to end in Chicago in a couple of days. And we were like, wait, we're going to be in Chicago too. He's like, no way. Let me get you guys tickets. When are you going to be there? And I was like, are we actually going to get to see Green Day live? Because Trey Cool saw Second City. But yeah our days did not overlap. Like oh. we were going there Friday. They were there on Wednesday, but such he, is the plight of the traveling superstar. Truly. And he like, no. he was so, so friendly and like he had minimal entourage. He just had, I guess his manager or girlfriend who knows. Mm. And she was like, <laughs> he loved the show. <laughs> like he really enjoyed the show. And I thought that was so nice because like he was, he wasn't too cool to be excited. And I love when oh. people, especially celebrities, but just people in general, they're mm-hmm. not too cool to show enthusiasm and joy. Cause I find a mm. lot of the times we're too, yeah, that's really cool because we don't want to look like we're super excited about something, but I think yeah. just be excited. Of joy. Yeah. Express yes. the joy. Do it. Yeah. Like, don't say a face. That like that is, that's Trey cool. No, is this why I'm unemployed? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Is hello on the phone? Um, I, I just got a phone call. Another technical opportunity. Here we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I would love to ask you about, um, okay, so a few months ago, I, yeah, time is a vacuum. This yeah, could be wrong it's that it's not a few months ago. Um, I reached out to you because I read a series of tweets that you tweeted about Second City. Mm-hmm. Uh, may I ask you about that? Of course. Okay. I mean, I tweeted um, about it. <laughs> I obviously don't have a problem with people oh knowing what I think. God, that is such a good freaking point, Anne. You know? Oh, yeah. I, part of me is like, um, are you, are you do okay? you feel comfortable? Are yeah, you, man. And you're like, I fucking tweeted it to the world. Uh, I, I have a lot of followers doing. and I tweeted it. Um, okay, so would you... I'm torn because I don't want to ask you to um, like syn- synopsize, synopsize the tweets. I also don't want to put word. I know. I'm sorry. I don't know if that's a word. I also don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, would you mind sharing just sort of why you wanted to share that tweet? Yeah. So basically I, what even was the tweet about? Oh, it was just about, <laughs> again like my body doesn't work I don't remember what I was actually <laughs> no, that's fine. saying what did I say hmm? mm-hmm. basically I wrote the tweet because I saw um, a comic that I have a lot of respect for in Chicago slash LA his name is Dwayne Perkins I'd met him one or two times when I went down to Chicago and he's such a funny person And he was uh, part of the Second City system in Chicago. And when the whole Black Lives Matter came up again, because it's been coming up many times, and Mm -hmm. uh, we as a society just keep failing to listen, but this time we did, he, uh, after the very, very unfortunate murder Murder, of George Floyd, the the topic of, um, you know, race relations and equity in workplaces came up and he tweeted about his experience at second city and at first Mm -hmm. i was like it's not my turn to speak it is we should be listening to black voices indigenous voices like i am a woman of color but i also know that my experience does not even come close to comparing to that of a black person or an indigenous uh person so i was very like okay just retweet it you don't have to say anything else uh elevate that voice Hmm. and then I was just like and then I slept I I slept on it and then I was and then I woke up feeling like no 
what you experienced is valid and it deserves the light of day and it deserves people to read about it and to see it. Uh, I, and I mean that as like the general public deserves to know this, the company deserves to know this, mm-hmm. um, people who I work with deserve to know this because it was very much outlining the different ways in which I was othered at my job. And this is a job that I loved. Like I mm-hmm. loved working at Second City. I loved my time there. It was so, so difficult, but it also opened up so many things for me. And so it was really difficult to be like, do I really want to burn this bridge of a place that I actually really enjoyed working at? Mm-hmm. Aside from, you know, the casual um, <laughs> bias, racial biases that exist in a, in a company. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, because I know that I'm not the only person with these experiences. And if I say something maybe someone else will feel comfortable to share their story. And Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of what I try to do in my work in comedy is to be an advocate because like we've said before in this podcast, I am mean and loud (laughs) (laughs) and I generally don't care if you don't like me because Mm -hmm. I think that what I have to say isn't untrue and it's not, on the wrong side of history (laughs) like Mm -hmm. I I, I'm not a I'm not a fool um I know what goes on and I know what's right and what's wrong and how and being a woman of color I see things in a different lens Mm -hmm. and so I try very hard in my work to make sure that I speak up for myself because I know that if I don't someone else that'll come after me is their job will be that much harder if I don't say that this isn't right and there was never any outward hostility or like racial profiling. Like I never really had it that bad, but that's what I would say to myself. But when I sort of like thought back on my time there and read my diary and my journal Mm -hmm. entries, I would read, Oh, you had a really hard time and it wasn't totally bad, but it could have been avoided and it could have not happened. So if you say something now, maybe it won't happen again like this to someone else. And so that's why I sort of went and spoke about my experiences in the hope that a someone would feel like they could share their story or B, if they didn't feel comfortable, then just having the words see the light of day, maybe it means that someone won't have to go through what I did. Mm-hmm. And I... It, I don't think I started anything. I really do think a lot of the Chicago Second City alumni and um, former and current employees really started this uh, movement about not exposing, but I guess exposing the company's accidental, on purpose, who knows, uh, behaviors that were exclusive and unsupportive to the BIPOC community and Mm -hmm. the LGBTQIA. Uh, plus community as well Um, and so just I really wanted to speak to that because if I don't who will Mm -hmm. because you know I am a bit of a leader in this community whether or not you buy into it but I I I know the privilege that I have and when I speak it is very I feel very fortunate that people do listen and I don't Mm -hmm. take that for granted and I want to use my power and my status to help change things for the better. Mm-hmm. And so that was to me like a no-brainer way of doing it because mm-hmm. it was backing up a movement that needed to be backed up and if my experience as a woman of color can add to that, then I'll do it. And I not to not coming from a place of well, I had it just as bad. I didn't. I really didn't. Um but I didn't have it easy and I think all mm-hmm. of the things that I went through could have easily been avoided if we were aware of you know, unconscious bias and things like that, things that we didn't talk about really last year or even six months ago, but we now have vocabulary for. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, I think also there's something to be said about like that it's when you're given the message or when you're taught by whoever um, that you need to compromise or like when it's in your brain that you need to normalize all of this or that it needs to, it's, it's amazing how much you can tolerate. And so I think that threshold for 
well, how bad does it have to be before it's bad enough that it's valid is like yeah. that threshold's a little too high. Yes. It, especially. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think it has to be the worst, the quote unquote, the worst thing that could happen in, in whatever that means to you in order for it to be worth raising concern about. Yeah. You know? And it's because, like, I do have a high tolerance. Like, I'll take a lot of shit in my professional life because I'm a fucking professional. Uh, Like, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let one shitty cast member ruin, like, my whole gig. Like, Mm -hmm. they don't mean that much to me. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I'd rather, (laughs) I know how lucky I am to have this job. And that's Mm -hmm. another thing, right? Like, this job was so hard to get. I, Mm -hmm. I waited five years for this job. I worked for five years until I got recognized. Mm. Which in itself is like, I wonder why a woman of color had to wait five years when mm-hmm. I see a lot of people who I was as good as uh, succeed. And that's mm-hmm. not to say, again, that I should have been there. But I was also like, well, why aren't I there? Yeah. And it's less yeah. about you don't deserve to be there. I do. And it's more about what what am I not doing that you are? Because mm-hmm. like, to me, I'm like, I'm doing the same thing that everyone else was, but I wasn't getting promoted. Mm -hmm. um but again like it's a job and because it's a job we take a lot of shit yeah because we're afraid to lose our job but at Mm -hmm. this point I don't I don't need to work there (laughs) (laughs) yeah but listen I still think I mean I just still saw it as like uh, the first thing I thought was like holy fuck that would be scary to tweet and fucking kudos for you doing it whether you whether you're working there now or not or whether you want to work there in the future or not there is a lot to lose it's easy to focus on that instead of what could potentially be gained for yourself or others and I just thought it was so yeah I just thought it was fucking awesome that you did that I I really do so I yeah I really wanted to touch upon that um yeah and like I I can take it and you know it's consistent it would be it's also consistent of me to speak up like I Mm -hmm. I didn't just take shit when I was working there or anywhere really Mm -hmm. like I did advocate for myself and I had to do it a lot but I it was important to me to do that and for me tweeting about it again well after the fact giving it more light giving it more eyes Mm. was no different from me going to the producer to be like why is my understudy a thin white woman? Do you mm. understand what that actually means? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what that, that sort of says, like what messages that sends or what to, even just to you, like what yeah. messages that sends to you about. You don't yeah. see my material for what it is. And that is like, this is a very specific point of view. And that is my mm-hmm. point of view. Mm-hmm. And that of a beautiful white woman is mm-hmm. not going to like, they would not have come up with the same material as me. So mm-hmm. please respect that. And mm-hmm. again, it wasn't out of malice. It was just out of a, Oh, I didn't even think about it that way. Mm-hmm. Of course, someone who looks like you would have a different perspective and say things in this scene. Like, even if the scene has nothing to do with my race or my gender or my size, I still bring my truth to it. And mm-hmm. um, you have to honor that. If you, if what if they're going to be strict about like understudies have to respect the material and you have to deliver it exactly as it is delivered, which is what we're told as understudies, then you can't also then say, oh yeah, but anyone can do your part. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense that, and I'm going to call you out on that. So Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've, and I've been saying it for a while and I just felt like, well, say it again. And this might be the last. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, especially like we said, if you're in this pressure cooker of like, okay, what do you uniquely bring to the table? And we're going to package it. Here we go. And then later you're like, wait a second during the process of making this show, my unique voice mattered so much and I had to spend so much time figuring it out. And now you don't, you can just throw it out the window and put anyone you want in there. Like that does not make sense yeah. to me. Yeah. 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 And yeah. anyone can see that. That's illogical. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, oh, and you're just so wonderful. I genuinely Aww, am like, I would, I'm just going to later, I'm just going to hit you off and be like, Hey, take some time to think about it. What is your rate for being a life coach? And like, let me know. <laughs> oh, no, I just, I should not take anyone's money. I should not be telling anyone what to do. And I can't take money for it. <laughs> You're like, I don't even want to do it for free because liability, I'm not doing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. No. I don't need anyone else's mess on my hand. I have my own. <laughs> 
Oh, that's amazing. Um, well, to wrap up, I would love to just ask you like a couple sort of quick questions to get to know you a little bit. Although I feel like I've gotten to know you over this and like, it's really lovely. I share a yeah, lot. <laughs> Hey, it's a dream for a podcast host to have a guest who shares a lot. So that's wonderful. You know what I mean? I'm just like, Mm -hmm. just present it. I don't just, why not? Mm. You know, why not? Why not? Yeah. Why not be open? Yeah. So yes. I love it. Okay. So, um, okay. So, and this I'm actually reading off cause I don't want to mess up my questions. Okay, Okay. So, um, oh, what's something you love that other people think is gross? (sighs) Oh, Look at that smile. <laughs> my my choice of men. <laughs> oh, that's such a, that's such a good one. You know oh what I mean? I'm God. just like I have absolutely like had crushes on real people, and my friends are like, "What? <laughs> Why?" Like, no. And I'm like, mm, "I don't know. <laughs> because... I don't know. He's cute. I like oh, him. He gives me butterflies. <laughs> oh, no. Love oh, his that's such a good one. Um, choice of men, truly. <laughs> choice of men. That's so good." Um, oh, I was thinking of pop tarts the other day while I was research. I was like, I really want pop tarts. And so then I started thinking, okay, what is a snack from your childhood that you still like really love? Uh, Pocky. <laughs> this, uh, there are the sticks, right? What's your favorite, um, flavor chocolate. that it's dipped in? Oh, chocolate. chocolate. I've never had one. I want one. I want to try the strawberry too. I feel like it looks really pretty. No, I haven't had one. Fine. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> if you like strawberry, I bet you it's delicious. I love chocolate. Like I, mm. I will always go for savory over sweet unless mm. it's chocolate. Like I love chocolate. Yes. I literally like I just chocolate. today while doing research was just like sitting here. I don't know why there's any left in the bag, honestly. They're you probably know, melted, but such a good chocolate bar that I haven't, that I didn't have in my childhood. It's, did you know that m ms makes chocolate bars now and it has little m M&M pieces in it? Yes. I've never had one, but I saw that at the grocery store. The the blue version. So like the cookie, I don't, the cookie m ms cookie m ms are like, and they have cookie been Cookie m ms They were a thing maybe in the like when I was around like 25 because I remember going to New York and going to like the M&M store and like getting huge bags of the cookie yes. M&M because they weren't available in Canada but those were like, so the inside is cookie is that what it is like it's oh, like a crumbles chocolate? yeah like so the M&M version of it yes there's cookie inside and then there's oh. the chocolate and then there's the shell but like this chocolate bar is like just a full chocolate bar but then there's also like M&M scattered throughout it's oh. so good I love, I love that. Yeah, M M&M, and M's are like I love they're my M&M. jam. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that sounds so good. I've, I'm going to now look for the cookie because I've never even seen that, and I want. Good to luck. Let me know. So bad. <laughs> yeah, Caramel I'll be shipping it too. Yeah, yeah. Oh Please. yes. Oh, so good. So good. I, I remember going through a phase. This is okay. Here's a hot tip. Um, yeah. If you ever love a treat, tell everyone. Post about <laughs> it. Tweet about it. Put it on your Facebook. Because people will remember. And I remember I was like, I wouldn't shut up about caramel M&Ms for like a full month on my social media. And for three months after that, people kept giving me caramel m and m Because they were like, oh, I saw these and I thought of you here. And I was like, thank oh you. My God, that is fucking genius. It's the best. Also, like, I don't know if you saw a few days ago on my Instagram, but like... <laughs> Norm Souza, who moved to LA, he's he was a Toronto comedian. He is a comedian, but he used to live in Toronto. Now he's in LA. And Mark Andrada, mm. they both sent me noodles, and I was just like, because I complained that no one was sending me noodles, and then I got Aww. two free noodles all on Saturday, and it was like the best. So oh. I know that's not the question, but my hot tip for everyone is yes. publicly state what you want, and your friends will get it to you. <laughs> Okay, I'm officially complaining and letting everyone know that I love the um the brand is Oh My Gods. They're like a bag of like chocolate cookie stuff and the dark chocolate one. Oh, oh. clusters, right? The clusters. Thank you. Oh my god, clusters. I'm putting it out there. And if anyone's gonna send you something, what do you want to be sent right now? This is a lot. I know, I know. So it's a lot of pressure. This is the most important question I've ever been asked in my whole it life. It really is. It's so gonna, gonna dictate like the next month for you. I'm gonna say money. <laughs> I really like the taste of money. I, I really like crisp so hundred dollar bills. I love the smell of maple. Please mm. send me money. <laughs> okay, but is there any truth to our money smelling like maple? Yes. Maple 
is that really a thing? Or were we just stupid gullible kids who were like, hey, <laughs> skip money? <laughs> Honestly, I... I was going to be like, I wish I had money to smell. But like, that sounds so sad. I just mean in my desk area. No, I got I no money. Yeah. I, I'm like, I no. haven't had cash since March. No. Yeah. Oh, had and cash. Well, then I started serving and they give me money for my tips. You know what I did? I put it in a Ziploc bag. I come home. I put it in a jar, wash my hands. And I'm like, that's going to sit there till we get a vaccine. And then we'll see how much money I have from that because I'm not touching Lysol. that. I know. I could just Lysol in the, in the little jar. Or know. you know what you know what to do in the jar, mm-hmm. put a bunch of water in it, put fucking dish detergent and shake it around because that's what really breaks like shit up, right? And I didn't even fucking clue in that like it's plastic. Yeah. <laughs> like, here I was like I'm gonna yeah. ruin money. Like no. I won't. That oh money goes to the wash. I could just leave it. That's exactly. Oh my god, I didn't even think of that. That's what I oh, should put it do. In the washing machine. <laughs> just maybe put I should it in just like <laughs> yeah, just put it in a pocket. <laughs> maybe I should just have a bath with it. Like just lay in all my money, but like all the soap. I, can you send me money so that I can bathe in it? <laughs> could you send me money so I could have a bath with COVID bacteria? I guess I need to wash it and then have a bath. And then it's like not, then it's not, it's not helping. Pure Scrooge McDuck swimming in a pool of coins and money, but it's just you <laughs> disinfecting five $10 bills. <laughs> yeah. I'll just, I'll be in a bath and then I'll lice all a $5 bill and then I'll drop it in the bath with me just for like a second wash. I will never feel as glamorous. That will be your Patreon account. That's what okay. you have to offer. <laughs> Money baths. <laughs> Money baths. Um, are you sure you don't want to choose something edible for people to send you along with money? I will I'm just, never I want to give you the option. Say no to noodles. Mm. I love noodles. 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 Okay. Noodles. Okay. That's it. Do you have a, a type of noodle that's the no, favorite? No, I don't discriminate. No. All, <laughs> all the noodles. I love all. it. I love it. All the noodles. All the noodles. Italian, you- Thai, Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese. I'll take it all. Oh. <laughs> Now I'm hungry. My partner and I make really this really yummy um, ramen recipe in an instant pot, and like, oh, it's so good. I need to do that. Yes. Do you have an instant pot? He bought me no, one, and then we make some I together. Want one now. Oh, yes. That's love. It's. <laughs> That's love. So yummy. Now that he leaves, now all I do is I'm like, oh. I put in like, no, oh, I'll just put like an egg on some rice, and I'll eat that now, and put some something on it because when he's on here I'm like I don't we don't live together and like when I'm here just making for myself I'm like "Eh, who cares make some toast yeah whatever other than the new like I would have been eating craft dinner like a real dog this whole weekend (laughs) if those two hadn't sent me so many noodles noodles. (laughs) like now I have to cook these I have to yeah um okay and my last question what are three adjectives that you would want your friends to use to to describe you (laughs) Just subscribe you. I was like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oh, this is this oh is no, gonna, what? This is gonna tell it all. <laughs> Rich. Oh, I love <laughs> this. Is like this. Me wanting this for myself, right? Yes, so I'm just gonna yeah. aspire to how I want to be described. Yes. Rich, rich, generous, and fun. Oh. Those oh, things. Fuck, I love those. Yeah. Rich, generous, and fun. Because what's I money feel like I already see you. Involved? Yeah. You know, oh my God. It's like Zach Efron. You and Zach Efron would get along so well. <laughs> oh I just my like, God. I'm so, I'm blushing. Like, do you think he's going to watch this? You yes. think Zach Efron's going to listen to this? Yes, I do. I think well, I'll, I'll, just, Zach, I'll just spam him. I'll just spam, spam, spam. And I feel like you're already so generous. And oh. I feel like you're already fun. And so I don't know if you're rich, but we're going to get no, that not. going. <laughs> well, we're going to. Well, <laughs> listen, we're going to. You could be rich and live in there. You're just like, I'm just sitting here. You just pan down. Right. You're like, I'm just sitting on money. You're back. You're like, how did she know That's- I bathe with money every night? <laughs> Who told her my secret? Who told her? We did hang I- out. What you're podcast like- did I talk about that on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She clearly stalked me on every podcast. Which one did she stay? Oh, my God. I've only so three funny. of them, so it's fine. <laughs> yes. What did I listen to? I think I, oh, I think I listened to three. No, I listened to four. Hmm. Well, like, but also, that. well, also, I was gonna say, like, also, I was gonna say, this is like from 2016 onwards that yeah. I think I like looked them up. So it's okay if you don't remember all of the ones that you've been on. It's been, I don't remember yesterday. Like me neither. Like yeah, the fact I that I, w- the fact that we were both able to have a coherent conversation <laughs> for this long. Yeah. Like my verbal skills have gone. It is. I am truly like. N- 
I have devolved into whatever the previous yes. version of humans are. I, <laughs> my brain yeah. doesn't work. So this has been refreshing. <laughs> oh, it's been refreshing for me too. Ooh. Thank you so much, Anne, for taking the time to chat tonight and being of so course. up to roll with the punches of the technical opportunities. Opportunities, um, yes. Opportunities. <laughs> And oh, it was just like, it was really, really nice to get to sit down and like get to know you today. So oh, thank, thank you, you so much. We'll do this, this again over a real drink and not in front of a screen. A computer that could yeah. like freeze and then I don't get to see you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> freeze while I'm just like, Trey cool. It was it Trey cool. <laughs> oh, so funny. And I love that you sent me that photo that like we happen to both be frozen on the screen in the same position. So I am going to be like uploading that on Instagram or it's, something to show people. I love that photo. I think it's such a cute it's photo. Great. It is a cute photo. It shows yeah. that we were like in sync, even though we didn't even know it. Yeah. It's so cute. I loved it. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Liquid Courage podcast. If you liked what you heard, please help me out by leaving a rating or a comment on your Apple podcast app or on YouTube or wherever you might be listening from. And if you're like me and you have an awful memory or you just don't want to have to remember when the next episode comes out, hit that subscribe button and the newest episode will automatically download for you. Just like magic. I love it. <laughs> you can also follow the podcast on Instagram at Liquid Courage Podcast and on Twitter at Liquid C Podcast. And if you're still listening, I want to remind you that a pandemic is still taking place. And I don't say that to be a buzzkill or to scare you, but to ask you to please, please continue or start wearing your mask when you're out of your house and around other people. We should be treating people how we want to be treated. And if you want to be safe and healthy, respect the health and safety of the people around you. Please. Thanks again for listening. It means the world to me. Stay safe and take care. Thank you.